Hello, um, we're going to be talking about lesson one of ninth edition Harris Quantitative Chemical Analysis. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about basics of chemistry, a couple of SI units, and a couple of um, stoichiometry, again, that we need to know, and other mathematical components to help you with the remaining chapters in this course. So let's get started. All right, so SI units. So in an SI unit, it's derived from French system international units. Um, they have a base unit, which is shown here. So these are base units. And in every base unit, like the meter, kilogram, um, second ampere, kelvin, candela, mole, radian, and steridian, there's going to be associated quantity with it. So for example, in the quantity link, the base unit would be meter. In quantity mass, the base unit will be kilogram. In the quantity time, it will be second. In the quantity electric current will be ampere. In the quantity temperature would be Kelvin. In the quantity luminous intensity would be candela. In the quantity amount of substance, the base unit would be mole. In the quantity um, plane angle, the base unit will be radian, and the quantity solid angle would be steridian. So those, once again, are the base unit. And at the bottom, we have prefixes. So what are those prefixes? So those prefixes are derived from multiples of 10. And those multiples of 10 is, in this table, is known as a factor. So in every prefix, there's going to be a factor that is coming from those mul base multiple of 10. So for example, giga would be 10 to the 9, deca would be 10 to the 1. And some things you need to know, in a Cartesian plane, which is your this plane right here, the x-axis right here, the horizontal plane, that's going to be your abscissa. At the thing that goes up and down, that's called ordinate in a Cartesian plane. And once again, I'm going to re reiterate this once again. Um, sometimes you have a quantity that comes from other multiple units. So we'll accept the frequency in here. But uh, for frequency, the unit is hertz. So hertz comes from a base unit. So the base unit being the time, which is in seconds. Force, similar thing. That one comes from meters per kilogram squared. And for pressure, which we know is going to be force per meter squared. That's how much you um, force exerted um, on a surface area. That one can be um, rewritten as Newton per meter squared. The reason why is because force is the um, um, the measurement of force is a newton. So we're just applying that thing in there and divide that by meter squared. And we know meter squared, well, meter, you know, it's a base unit. So we don't need to do anything with it. However, in newton, you can certainly express it with other base units. That's why we can still um, say it as here, um, this meter per kilogram squared. And if you do a little bit of math, you're going to get this one right here. And that's the same thing with the rest in here. They all came from um, these other quantities. And they do a little bit of derivation to get its um, other units and also to use that for our base units. Okay. Converting from one unit to another. So the issue from converting one unit to another, it can be problematic if you're not given a table to units or yeah to sorry to the yeah to the units that don't that are not based on multiples of ten. So for example, in pressure, you have bar atmosphere tor. Clearly, those are not really based on multiples of 10, which is the prefix that we talk about there. Instead, they have their own number. 
that is determined experimentally. Okay. So that's just one thing to know. If you're going to have um, problems with this, you need to have a table where you can like refer its SI equivalent to. Okay. Okay, so let's do this problem. Express the rate of energy used by a person walking two miles per hour, which is 91 calories per hour per 100 pounds of body mass in kilojoules per hour per kilogram body mass. So I know it's a lengthy one. Um, just a note, the 91 calories in here is the same thing as a 91 kilocalories because the food... Calories, if you do a little bit of search on the internet, that's a kilocalorie. So just remember that. I know they didn't really explain that, but it's just good to know. We know that 91 calories, oops, let me do it. This is how I would approach this problem. We have 91 calories. Okay. We know, like what I said, this 91 calories, so one big C is equals to, okay, it, it is one K cal. Okay, now our given is this 91 kilocalories per, um, actually I forgot the, per hour or per 100 brain, okay? So you technically have this um, per pound. So now, how do you convert it now to um, joules? So we look at the mass because joules and um, sorry, joules and calories, sorry, are a form of energy. So we look at the energy, and we see that here, one thousand calories. So remember, one thousand calories. This is different from the food calorie, which is um, the big C. So 1,000 calories in this one is equivalent to 1 kcal. So we can definitely use the um, this one right here, okay? So just remember, 1 kcal is be 1,000 calorie. And then 1,000 calorie is going to be... Um, it's going to be 4.184 kilojoules. So that one should be done. Yeah, okay. So once we have that, the other thing that we need to worry on is this 100 pounds because we want the 100 pounds into kilogram. So pound and kilogram, um, they're both mass. So we know pound, pound. Okay, so, so we know one pound. So remember, the 100 pound is on the bottom, so you don't want that to be on the bottom. You want it at the top. Then times it by um, 0.453592237 kilograms. Okay, pounds cancel out. Oh, sorry, this one won't cancel. This one will cancel out. This one will cancel out. This one will cancel out. Okay, so you're only left with. Um, now kilojoules per hour per kilogram, and you're gonna get this one. That's your answer. It's 8.4 kilojoules per hour per kilogram. Okay, some definitions you need to know for a concentration. So, in the concentration, we have a solute and a solvent. So, solute is what's more or what's less in the concentration, solvent is what's more typically in a solution. Um, also, we can classify your solution as a homogeneous and heterogeneous. So homogeneous in here would have a uniform composition, meaning that the composition in that solution would be the same. There's no um, distinct layers in there. Kind of like, you know, what you see with oil and water, because those are heterogeneous. Um, another thing to know when we're doing the mathematics in here 
is Avogadro number. So Avogadro number tells you that it's that the number of atoms in 12 grams of carbon 12. So that's going to be Avogadro's number. Molarity would be moles of solute divided by liters of solution. Got to remember that. And then in a concentration, the if the individual um, compound can be dissociate, meaning it can be easily broken down into its um, individual ions, you can say that there are strong electrolytes. Sometimes that's not the case if you have sugar water. And the reason why is that um, that sugar water is not made out of ions. So we call those ones as a weak electrolyte. Um, another math that you need to know is that atomic mass is the number of grams containing Avogadro, which is the number of atoms. So grams per atoms molecular mass, which is the sum of atomic mass of the atoms in the molecule, and form formula mass, which is just a fancy way of saying molecular mass, which is the um, sum of all atomic masses of a strong electrolyte. So an example of that is the um, molecular mass of a, um, NaCl. Because NaCl, you can dissociated into Na plus and Cl minus. That's the reason why it's a strong electrolyte. All right, so let's do this problem. The molarity of salts in the sea. Um, typical seawater contains 2.7 grams, so I'm going to write it down, of salt. Per, per means deficient, per 100. Okay, so... So that's good. And what's the molarity in here? So molarity, remember, is going to be most of solute. My solute in here is the salt, which is NaCl. Oops. Divide by liters of my solvent, which in this case, it's just water. Okay. Sea water, to be specific. Okay. So... Um, we have right now in grams, and my strategy in here is how do we convert from grams into moles, because that's what part of the molarity is, right? So we need it, um, um, atomic mass, okay, of NaNCl. So we know um, Na, according here, it's about 23 grams per mole. So I'm just going to say 23 here, plus my CL, which is about 35.45. Um, I'm just going to say it's 35.5. Um, so if we add that together, we have roughly about 58.5 grams per mole. So we have grams per mole right now. And we don't want grams per mole. We want moles. So... What do we have here though? We have 2.7 grams. So 2.7 grams, what I'd like to do is put similar unit um, in the completely opposite side of one another. So this is the 58.5 grams there and divide it by there. So 2.7 divided by 58.5, as you can tell here, it's gonna be 0 0.046 moles, but that's not our answer yet. We have this 100 times 10 to the negative third, okay, that is on the given. It's a liter to give you 0.46 as our answer. M. That's a unit of molarity, big M. Now, how do we convert how many grams there is in a 20, 25 of seawater? That's weird. Yeah, it should be 25 milliliters of seawater. Oops. Oops. 25 milliliters of seawater. So what you're going to do is that um, same thing. Um, you start by getting it...
its molecular mass. So the molecular mass of this is going to be 95, 20 grams per mole. And then, so let me write it down, 95.20 grams per mole. Okay. And what you're going to do next is that once we have that, right, we're still not done yet. And we want, um, let's see, just the... Yeah, just the <clears throat> the grams, okay? So once we have that, we know that we have, I don't know where that 0 0.054 is coming from, but we have the 0 0.054 moles per liter. And what you're just gonna do is remember, you want one unit, it's opposite side with another. So you're canceling out that same unit so you're only left with now grams per liter. Like you don't want grams per liter, we just want the um, grams. So you're just gonna multiply that by your liter to get your grams as your answer. All right, let's do once again a problem with um, molality. A chemist decided to pull up a bottle with 6.0 mole per gram solution it has 36 moles of NaCl molecules what is its mass in kilograms so molality and the reason why it's molality is because if it's molarity it's going to be liters per solution but that's not the case you have 6.0 moles per gram of solution indicative of molality molarity remember solution liters of solution molality grams per solution so molality grams up sol, there should be kilograms there. And then molarity, it's liters. So for molality in here, it's this one, it's not on its proper unit, okay? Well, we're gonna fix that one later. And the reason why is because we're gonna fix that one quite easily if we do this. So we know this is the formula for molality. This is just the moles component of molality. Now, what's the mass? So, remember the formula for molality? So, that's just moles oops, per kilograms. Certainly, it's not on kilograms yet, but we can fix it. Because our answer would still be in grams, but you don't want grams, you want kilograms. So, it's fine for now. 6.0 moles per grams equals 36 moles plus this. Okay. To get the kilograms by itself, which is your mass, um, I'm going to do mol molality equals or times kilograms equals mole. So then kilogram in here would be moles divided by molality. So moles in here is 36. We have 6.0 moles per gram. That's 6.0 moles. So you have 6.0 grams. If you want to go from your unit back into kilograms, we're going to divide that by 1,000. So since we by 1 or 1,000, that should be the answer. Um, percent composition. The percentage of a component um, in a mixture solution is usually expressed as a weight percentage. So weight percent is equals to mass of solute divided by mass of total solution or mixture. And this is the same thing with volume percent. Instead of um, weight, this time it's going to be um, the volume of your total solution. So mass of solution or mass of solute divided by mass of solution times 100 for volume is going to be volume of solute divided by volume of solution times 100. All right, so how do we do this parts per million, parts per billion problem? The way I do this personally is that PPM and PPV, they are um, units of measurement. They're actually measurement of composition. So parts in here is just gonna be mass over your um, stuff, divided by mass of your sample. Then times it by 
whatever. So if they said million in here, it's going to be six. If it's billion, it's going to be 10 to the nine, okay? So what's the mass percentage of Fe in a piece of metal with 87 grams of Fe and 113 grams of sample? So mass percentage, remember, is just going to be your sample divided by total. So your sample in here would be, actually, it's going to be your stuff that you have over your sample. Let's see total there. So once you figure that one out, that gives you now the mass percentage. If you divide that times it by 100, obviously, okay? So 87.9 divided by 113. So that's going to be 87.9 divided by 113. So it's going to be 77.79%. Okay, so that we answered that one problem. Now we're going to use this same thing, okay, and then times it by 6 if it's PPM. So it's going to be, whoops, it's going to be 700. 77,876 ppm. And then this one, if it's billion, it's going to be um, a million. Okay. So 777 million, 876,106. Okay. All right. So um, here's another one problem, and this is about copper two sulfate. So copper two sulfate pentahydrate has five moles of H2O for each mole of CuSO4 in a solid crystal. And then they give you the formula mass, and then they're asking you how many grams of this pentahydrate that you have should be dissolved in a volume of 500 milliliters to make eight millimolar of CO2 plus. Okay, so this is our given. This is our given, so that should be good, okay? A millimolar in here would just be converted into this, okay? And the reason why is that milli is just technically, um, if you're going to go back from your mole into milli, you're moving three spaces to the left. And that's the reason why it's one times 10 to the negative three. Okay. Just so you won't get confused with that. Um, after that, um, the next one is that you have... Um, molarity in here so after you've done your molarity and converted the 500 milliliters once again into liters which divided by 1000 right because same thing right we're just divided by 1000 so we move three spaces to the left and you should get this but that's just your mole you want it in grams so what you're going to do is using your um, molar mass you can now figure out the mass of the reagent which is this one so your moles in here just cancel out getting us with this grams right here another way to figure out either the concentration of your um concentration solution or diluted solution or the volume of your concentration solution or your volume of your diluted solution is by using the dilution formula. So that's just the simple formula. It's just M1, V1, M2, V2. Typically in here, like what they put here, this is gonna be your concentrated solution. 
then this is going to be your diluted solution. And the dilution formula tells us how many milliliters to withdraw from the concentration. So this is going to be in this one to obtain 0 0.100 moles of HCl. So um, remember that this is your molarity. So we know that one's concentrated. Next, we have one there. And we know we have 12.1 that is concentrated. And we're trying to find V1. And then what we're going to do is just divide that by 12.1 on both sides to get 8.26 milliliters. Well, 8 point, yeah, 8.26 milliliters as your answer. The um, thing that I can tell you for any dilution formula, if your unit is different from one another, so for example, if you have, that's weird. Yeah, if you have one liter in here, you need to convert that into milliliters, okay? Because in a um, dilution, you need to have the same unit all throughout. And that's the reason why it's one in there, okay? And lastly, we're gonna do a little bit of stoichiometry. So um, just a review from your general chemistry, always write your chemical reaction, balance your chemical reaction, convert the reactants into moles, divide by its coefficient, and the reactant that has mole number is limiting. The limiting inner chemical reaction is the one that is consumed first. Once the limiting reagent is gone, the reaction ends. So this is an example, and we're gonna do this one the way we do it. That one, nitric oxide reacts with the oxygen gas to form nitrogen dioxide, in a, dark, a dark brown gas. In one experiment, we have this amount, and we have this amount determining the limiting reagent. So um, is it balanced? Well, let's see. We have 2N there, 2N there, and we have 0, 4, yes. So those are balanced. The next step is convert reactants into moles. Are we? Yes, they're all in moles. We don't need to do that. And then divide that by our coefficient. So we're just going to divide this by our coefficient. This one is going to be 0 0.433. Well, this one is going to be 0 0.503 on our oxygen. So the 0 0.433 of NO, that's our limiting reagent. Okay. So for NO is limiting reagent. Then how many? Um, calculate the number of moles of N2 is being produced. Since we know this is, since NO is our limiting reagent, we can just do 0 0.06 moles of NO. Um, we know 2 moles of NO is 2 moles of NO2. So it's going to be point. One point seven three two divided by two, so that's roughly so one point seven three two divided by two. It can be point eight six six moles of NO two being produced. So that's just the thing. If they ask you for some reason, what's the excess one? So the excess one, remember, is the one that we have more um, moles at the end, which is O2 in this example, okay? And then calculate the number of moles being produced with our excess reactant. So you do the same thing. You calculate now using this one. Uh, using this given to um, get our answer there, okay? And the two mole of NO2. And that's about it.